Our first presenter is paleontologist and University of Chicago professor and a National Geographic explorer. Originally from Naperville, Dr. Paul Sereno's research carries him to the remote corners of the world to discover dozens of new fossil species under the harshest of conditions. He sees paleontology as an exciting blend of art, history, and science all wrapped in adventure. Please help us welcome Paul Sereno. Why questions are are really difficult. And frankly, uh, evolution, why questions are particularly difficult. At the lowest level, why do you look different than your sister or your brother? I mean, quite frankly, a lot of it is chance. So I didn't think these questions were answerable either when I became a professor. Why these mammals that you're familiar with, and they look very different than dinosaurs, uh, hanging in trees, running fast in the Kentucky Derby, swimming. Uh, they look very different than dinosaurs. Uh, ponderous, some of them, generally not too small. Not digging, not hanging in trees, not running. Well, maybe not running. We can't see too many of them today. Um, here's the big idea, and I'm real excited about this. Dinosaurs look different because they are built differently. Here's, here's the big idea. The key evolution is functional modules, musculoskeletal regions that get to be independent of one another and therefore evolve independently. We started out like this, we being vertebrates, fish, unified, a single body. You know that from eating them. <laughs> their heads don't move separate from their body. On land, things changed. Uh, the first thing on top, they didn't change very much. There's no neck, there's no nothing. Really, they could have colored the whole body in, say, a salamander, for example. Uh, but dinosaurs did something really important that mammals didn't do. We did, but from a very different route. They walked on two legs. That's how they all started. And that separated the forelimbs from the hind limbs. And so uh, uh, something else happened along the way. They became birds. And in birds, they separated the tail from the hind limbs. So they ended up, and you'd know this from eating a chicken if you cook chickens, there's a, sort of a bony part in the back between the legs and the tail. The tail wiggles completely separate from the hind legs, not needed at all. And so um, you can see this you know, looking at uh, muscle actions, a bird that takes off the bottom diagram. Literally, you see the action in the feet, then that landing gear comes up and becomes inactive and the forelimbs take over. It really is an amazing thing that happened in evolution and it happened gradually. It happened so beautifully gradually, we have every kind of transition and not only do we have every kind of transition from dinosaur to bird, as soon as they gained this wondrous power of flight, they lost it. <laughs> Lots of times, as you know. So not only that, when these modules became independent, like the tail, they went off in 10 different directions to give us more species than mammals still today. Dinosaurs dominate 10,000 species. Now, there's two other kinds of flighted animals, vertebrates, uh, and the pterosaurs were the first. You know them. They're called pterodactyls in the common lore, and bats. Okay, that's the mammal version. Now, if we look at this, a bird, gradual evolution, frequent loss of flight. Now, compare that to a pterosaur, which are many different species. They appear in a fleck in the fossil record. And bats, too. All the years, we've been digging up all these intermediates on dinosaurs, not a single transitional form for these other groups. And never do they lose flight. Do you know of a flightless bat wandering around? <laughs> no, I don't. There's many thousands of species. They had 60 million years. So why? Well, their forelimbs are not independent, their hind limbs, their tail is not independent of their hind limbs. They don't have functional modules. Let's look at some other animals. Here's crocodiles. We know them as sort of subaquatic animals, but there's one I dug up. That's what they look like in the fossil record. They're actually upright. And here's one that runs in a very strange and funny way. It's the only species, the freshie of Australia, that can run like this. And it, it gallops, and it looks so strange, and the head is moving up and down. It's actually quite strenuous. Um, not very gainly, if you would. Um, well, the hind limb is still connected to the tail. That could be part of the problem. The tail is a great place to anchor a hind limb muscle, to move the, tail, the, to move the legs back and forth. And so it's really not independent. Now, if we look at a mammal, totally different. Okay, Mammals loosened up the shoulder girdle. You sitting in your chair or at home out there can move one shoulder and not the other. Okay. That allows that beautiful horse to make one leg longer than the other, giving it the ability to gallop, trot, scamper, if you will, 
unbelievable. And it allows this cheetah to go at 45 miles an hour at 45 degrees chasing a similarly adept gazelle as their shoulders move all over the place in asynchrony. Well, that's not the way that, uh, well, what that allowed in mammal evolution, not only do they have a tail that could become anything because it got independent of the hind limbs, just like birds, but their shoulders were independent so they could move. And so whale evolution, easy and gradual. And there's many, many aquatic animals. Dinosaurs, no aquatic animals to speak of. I just got through describing the closest ca uh, caller for dinosaurs, a fish-eating monster. Uh, it sucks as a swimmer to be, <laughs> to be point blank about it. No swimming dinosaurs, their tail was not independent. So I think we're coming to understanding how dinosaurs look the way they do. Thank you. <laughs>